Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about dilated cardiomyopathy in canines. So dilated cardiomyopathy, which I'm just going to abbreviate as DCM, is the most common cardiac disease in large breed dogs. These are going to be breeds which are considered to be predisposed to DCM. This includes breeds such as the Doberman Pinscher, the Great Dane, the Boxer, and the Cocker Spaniel, just to name a few. Just to clarify, DCM is not limited to these large breeds. There are plenty of smaller dog breeds out there which end up developing DCM, but they tend to develop DCM as a result of factors outside their genetic makeup. And this has actually become a pretty hot topic of veterinary medicine in the last couple of years. The reason for this is because there's been a noticeably large increase in the number of DCM cases in dog breeds which have not historically been predisposed to DCM. So dilated cardiomyopathy is a disease of the heart muscle. So typically this is seen as a decrease in the actual muscle tissue or there's a loss of muscle function, but it can actually definitely be both of these. Um, causes of DCM can be chemical. So there's actually research papers that have looked at how drugs used in chemotherapy to treat cancers such as doxorubicin and epirubicin have been linked to causing DCM. And I'll link all these research papers and website links in the description too for you guys. So DCM can actually develop as a result of viral infection too. So parvovirus can actually cause this or it can be um, a cause of nutrient deficiency. So specifically taurine deficiency. Um, or it can be genetic. So as mentioned earlier, some dog breeds are simply genetically more predisposed than others to developing the specific cardiomyopathy. So here on the left is a healthy heart with normal and well-developed cardiac muscle. And this is showing both the systole and diastole actions of the cardiac cycle. So the systole is the contraction of the heart where the blood is being pumped from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and then into the lungs for the oxygenation. And then the pumping of the oxygenated blood from the left ventricle into the aorta to the rest of the body. And then the diastole is where the atriums and ventricle fill. So here's an animation showing both the systole and diastole actions of the heart. So as the cardiac muscle contractility is lost, the cardiac output decreases. So to help compensate for this loss of the cardiac output, the chambers of the heart, so the left and left right ventricles, and eventually both atriums as well, dilate. This allows the chambers to hold more blood. So even though there is, isn't as much contractility, there is still a sufficient amount of cardiac output. However, this compensation can only last for so long until the dilated heart is at its max. Once the heart reaches this point, many symptoms may become more, much more obvious to the observer. This is because since the heart can no longer compensate for the reduced cardiac output, less and less oxygenated blood is available throughout the body as the heart muscles continue to lose function and or mass. And eventually this will lead to congestive heart failure. So I made a couple of animations with audio of what a healthy heart as well as a heart with DCM sound like. So you guys can watch that and listen to it as well. So I'm going to go over some of the diagnostic tools used to diagnose DCM and congestive heart failure. So one of the best tools to use is actually an echocardiogram. So an echocardiogram is basically an ultrasound of the heart. And the reason it's one of the best tools to use is because you're actually going to be able to see the chambers of the heart as well as the cardiac output. And kind of based on those values, it's really going to help you determine, you know, how the heart's functioning overall. The next is an NT Pro BMP or just simply Pro BMP. So B type natriuretic peptide is what you're actually going to be testing for and it's a hormone. So this is a hormone that's secreted primarily by the ventricular myocardiogram and it's going to be secreted in response to wall stress or it's going to be, you know, volume expansion or just pressure overload. So and anything that's causing the heart undue stress, this, you know, this hormone is typically secreted and you'll test for it and depending on whether or not that hormone is elevated, that will actually tell you, um, you know, if the heart is working too hard. So the problem with this a lot of times is, you know, you're not actually able to get, you know, a high or low value of ProBMP. Typically, you know, if you're using like a snap test, it'll just give you, you know, 
that you have, you know, an abnormal value. You'd have to send it out to like an IDEX lab or something in order to get, you know, specific values. So another test you can use is just, you know, chest radiographs. So looking for an enlarged heart or cardiomegaly, this is gonna be a really great tool to use too because it's actually gonna give you that visual aspect um, of congestive heart failure or DCM. So treatment and prevention of DCM. So I'm gonna talk about two medications that are typically prescribed um, for DCM. So this is gonna be enodilators and loop diuretics. So for enodilators, um, such as pemobendin, they're gonna be PD3 inhibitors, and this is gonna cause an increase in intracellular calcium, as well as increase the sensitivity to that calcium. And what this is gonna do is this is gonna encourage um, cross-bridge cycle. So if you remember the cross-bridge cycle, what that is, is basically a muscle contraction. So what happens, you know, you have a action potential that's going to release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then that calcium is going to bind to troponin, cause a conformational change and, you know, allow those myosin and binding sites to be exposed. And then the actin and myosin will bind, you know, and that cross bridge cycle is going to continue and cause a muscle contraction. So what this is going to do is just basically, you know, encourage the heart to continue pumping by causing, you know, a sensitivity to that calcium that's needed for muscle contraction. And then for loop diuretics, such as furosemide, what this is gonna do is it's actually gonna change the osmolarity in the loop of Henle, and this is gonna cause more electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride, to be excreted into the urine. So water typically follows salt. So what this is gonna do is gonna increase the amount of urine volume that's excreted by the individual with DCM. So why this might be beneficial is because DCM typically leads to congestive heart failure. So there's, and part of that is, you know, ascites or pulmonary edema. So by giving furosemide, we're gonna change the osmolarity and that's gonna start pulling fluid from the rest of the body. But it's also gonna start pulling fluid from areas that it shouldn't be. So if uh, you know a dog has ascites, it's gonna start pulling the abdominal fluid and excreting it as urine. It's also gonna do the same thing for pulmonary edema, which is why it's really beneficial. So I kind of mentioned earlier that DCM has actually become a pretty hot topic in veterinary medicine and that the reason for this was because there's been an increase in the amount of cases of DCM, but it's been in breeds that, you know, of dogs that haven't, you know, considered to be predisposed to the condition. So the FDA kind of became aware of this in like 2018 and they really started to encourage people to, you know, kind of report these, you know, situations. So the FDA every year has kind of been following up on this and what they've actually found, you know, with different um, institutions doing research and whatnot, that it's actually starting to look more like a dietary issue. So in terms of prevention, you know, this multiple studies are backing this up, but you're actually going to want to avoid um, grain free dog food. And the reason for this is because it's actually not what, you know, it's not the absence of grain that's causing DCM potentially, but it's actually what they're substituting the grain for. So legumes, potatoes, you know, those sorts of things. So I pulled up this paper on um, this titled Investigation of Diets Associated with Dilated Cardiomyopathy in Dogs Using Food Nomics Analysis. So this paper is actually using some pretty sophisticated, you know, analytical um, methods in order to kind of dissect, you know, what the problem is. And, you know, you they're using some pretty sophisticated, you know, methods. So this is also pointing to, you know, grain-free diets being one of the main causes. So in terms of prevention, this is going to be one of your best bets just to avoid that grain-free dog food and try to stick with something with, you know, a more holistic diet. Well, guys, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful for learning about dilated cardiomyopathy in canines.